Six years ago, Latasha Rouse brought her three-year-old son with autism, and her triplets born at 26 weeks gestation to their primary care pediatrician for the infant's first checkup. One was on oxygen and had a gastric tube. It was her pediatrician's empathetic, how are you doing? And a discussion that followed that, that provided Ms. Rouse the support she needed. As she later noted, it was the first time someone had asked her how she was doing. It made such a difference. Since then, Ms. Rouse has partnered with clinicians, health systems, and organizations to support families and connect the parent voice with clinical teams. Here to share her perspectives on improving parental involvement and supporting resilience in families of children with chronic illness is Ms. Latasha Rouse. Thank you to the Academy of Pediatrics and the American Board of Pediatrics for selecting me to give the 2019 Stockman Lecture. Dr. James Stockman is the former president and CEO of the American Board of Pediatrics. It is my privilege to give this lecture in his honor today. Building resilience for patients and families. This is a photo of my husband, Will, and myself 10 years ago. We were not sure what we were doing, but we knew we wanted to give this kid the best we could offer. We had read all the books, we toured doctor's offices, and we found a pediatrician that put us at ease. We chose the office based on the tour and how nurturing the environment felt. Not long after this picture, our son was born. He was the baby boy that we prayed for, that we dreamed of, and he was all ours. And we were so in love with this kid. Dr. Kelly, our pediatrician, seemed to recognize that we were just scared parents with our first baby. My baby hit all the milestones and we noticed that he was really quick to catch on to things. By age two, he could count backwards from 10. Over the next years and months, I became concerned about his speech being delayed based on other kids on the playground. I found myself comparing his language skills to other children all the time. I would ask others what their thoughts were, and I got mixed reviews. Some folks thought there was something to look into, and others thought he's just a boy. By age two and a half, he was able to look at this basketball with the letters NBA on it, and he'd say, Nubba. He was sounding out words before he could have a conversation with me. Soon after that, my husband and I would find out that we were having another baby, and another baby, and another baby. <laughs> that was my reaction. <laughs> after being pregnant for only 26 weeks, the triplets were here, and our oldest son was three and a half. It was a crazy difficult time. It was definitely a fight or flight situation. On our way, our way of coping with it was just to focus on the kids and we wanted to fight for them as hard as they fought to be here. I personally found that I gave everything I had to everyone else and I was not on the list. And I thought eventually I would break, but I couldn't. The staff in the NICU were amazing, and they made sure that I was well informed. I had care team meetings to discuss the baby's progress and the next steps. There were many phone calls in the mornings after rounds for updates. The nurses were the gentle hands that my babies needed. And there were also my advocates when I brought up concerns I had about my babies. Let 
The mask I wore made it difficult for me to dive into my personal struggles. The nurses were so busy and there were so many sick babies that they would say, hey, how you doing? And I would say, I'm good, how are you? I didn't want to bother them any more than I had to. The babies eventually started to come home from the hospital. And my son's speech and the concerns I had about it just kept bubbling up. I wanted to know why we could do complex things like at this point read at a first grade level, but not hold a conversation with me still. He was just so smart, I wanted to know what was he thinking? Why could he play for hours and not say a word? Once all four of the kids were home from the hospital, my pediatrician wanted to come, wanted me to come in for a huge visit with all four kiddos to come up with a plan for what to do next. The resolutions that we came up with in that meeting were going to take us forward. So I showed up to that appointment and I had a double stroller, a kid strapped to my chest, and a preschooler. And I was at that appointment alone. But my pediatrician helped me to feel like I was not alone. And she made me feel like if there was a resource out there, she would be thinking of me to see if I needed it. I had a teammate in her. Over the next years and months, Brandon, my oldest son, was diagnosed with mild to moderate autism. We started speech therapy, OT, and ABA therapy as suggested. Then he transitioned into a small preschool with typical kids. The triplets were also in therapy and doing well. Our pediatrician was a constant support and nothing happened without her knowing, and that was by her design. She knew every detail of what was going on with us, and she still does. Thank you, Dr. Laura Kelly. One pediatrician can make such a difference. One pediatrician can help a family feel resilient and able to cope with their child's challenges. I have had the opportunity to attend several meetings at the American Board of Pediatrics, focusing on learning from patients and parents. The board recognized that these conversations can be difficult, especially for children with chronic conditions. Most medical schools and training programs have not focused on this. Several parents asked the board, how could pediatric doctors learn to address the emotional needs of families and their kids to ensure that these conversations happen? As we spoke more with families, it was clear that no matter the chronic condition, all of us wanted the same thing. We wanted to know that the kids and their families were addressed as a whole person. Here's a little video to show you a piece of the magic that happened during our collaboration. You know, chronic conditions, chronic illness um, for kids and for our parents is really, really hard. It's um, a life of constant worry and um, and it's hard. There's some really, really hard times, and it's 24-7. It requires constant 24-7 management. It takes no holidays. There's no breaks. It doesn't go away on your birthday. It doesn't go away because you go to Disney World. It's always there. When you are raising children with chronic illness, you know, you will feel overwhelmed. I mean, that's, that's just a part of your story. It's a part of your journey. It takes a psychological toll on you, on you and the people surrounding you. Traditionally, medicine and pediatrics has segregated behavioral health into the psychiatry realm and hasn't paid attention. 
but we're beginning to understand that if you don't, in fact, uh, support behavioral health of children and their families, everything else uh, falls apart. Especially in chronic illness care when the specialty provider is really the primary provider. We think some about the patient, we think a little bit about the parents, and we almost never think about the effect that it's having on the rest of the family, the siblings in particular. There are lots of barriers to doing this. One is time. There's also issues around feelings of inadequacy to address certain issues. It's just lack of resources. You know, you, you are expected to be strong. Sometimes we, as patients, kind of silo our concerns. Uh, and so if I'm going to the gastroenterologist, I'm only going to talk about everything from my mouth down and not my mouth up. When we went to um, Children's, they recommended that my sons talk to a mental health professional. And first I'm like, uh, they're not crazy, but I had to get past what I had learned, um, the stigma associated with seeking out a mental health professional. The principle of if you're on an airplane and you need to, you know, use oxygen, you always put it on yourself before you put it on someone else. But what I realize now is that until mama has what she needs, that baby can never thrive. It took me a long time to realize that it's okay to do something for myself and not feel guilty about it. We get to our pediatrician for the first time with all four children. And I walk in, I have one with a G-tube and oxygen. I have one child that's beeping because he hears the machine beeping. He's three and he's just beeping. And my pediatrician turned to me and said, how are you doing? And it wasn't the how are you doing where people are trying to get their papers and they're not even looking at you. It was stop everything, hold the line, how are you doing? That was the first time someone asked me how I was doing. What would you do to make this better for another child? And my daughter looked at me and said, I wish that they would have listened to me and asked me how I felt about what was happening. Well, how are you doing? How's your family doing? I would like that to be just like, you know, you come in and they say, stand on the scale. You know, we're taking the, you're taking your weight, you're taking your blood pressure, it would just be common practice. Um, there's the, hey, I'm Dr. Crandall, how are you? And there's, hey, how are you? This, is, this had to have been tough the last couple of weeks. But if we start working with families from the time of diagnosis, very early, so that they begin to understand that their resilience is important for their child, that their emotional well-being is crucial for outcomes for the family and their child, then I think that uh, the care team can take responsibility for partnering with families to achieve this. Can we always provide everything that somebody needs? No, but can we do something better than nothing? almost every time, absolutely. We need, in fact, to do this in a learning mode because we really don't know how to do this optimally. It's gonna take persistence. Emotional behavioral health is really important for these families. It's okay to ask for help. I think we do our children such a disservice by not addressing all the things that they're about and understanding all their needs and their dreams and their hopes. I mean, part of this is seeing the future and seeing a child who can do anything. Not only are the families stronger, but the kids are better. The Roadmap Project and the work of other organizations like the American Academy of Pediatrics are developing tools and strategies so that pediatricians like you can support families to be resilient and emotionally healthy. For me, it was a pediatrician that follows my children and other families, it's a specialist. For the important thing to know is that we don't expect you to solve all our problems, but just having the conversation is supportive. And even if, they're not, if the resources are not available, listening helps. In my case, I needed information to be able to manage my children's care and a place to discuss my concerns and how to chart my path forward. That made me feel like I could help in some way 
and that I had control over something in my life. I celebrated every milestone with my pediatrician at follow-up appointments, and she shared in the joy of each moment. So whether you're caring for a premature infant, a child with autism, or a child with chronic conditions, you're asking, how are you doing? Can really make a difference in that family feeling resilient and emotionally healthy. Thank you for all you do for children and families.